We are following breaking news. New Jersey Democratic Senator Bob Menendez and his wife have been indicted on federal bribery charges. The Department of Justice says the couple accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars of bribes from three New Jersey businessmen. Federal prosecutors allege Menendez used his influence to benefit the three men and the government of Egypt. In a statement, the senator says they, quote, misrepresented the normal work of a congressional office. The charges stem from a years-long public corruption investigation into the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. There are things that Senator Menendez says he can do for his constituents and things that he says he cannot do for his constituents. He put it all on his Senate website. So, for instance, it says he cannot compel an agency to act in someone's favor. It says he cannot influence matters involving a private business. It says he cannot get involved in criminal matters or cases, period. But we allege that behind the scenes, Senator Menendez was doing those things for certain people. Jessica Levinson and Robert Legary join us now. Jessica is a CBS News legal contributor, and Robert is a CBS News Justice Department reporter. All right, so Jessica, walk us through the evidence laid out in this indictment. The evidence here is that Senator Menendez enriched himself, made decisions not for the public good, but for the private good, meaning his bank account, and that he took bribes, that he took, we saw gold bars, that he took cash, and that he took that money in order to affect investigations, in order to um, do things like use his position as a public official and give a foreign government, the Egyptian government, sensitive information. This goes to the heart of what it doesn't mean to be a public servant. Being a public servant means that you run for office or you're appointed in order to make decisions to benefit your constituents, not to make decisions that benefit yourself. And that's what we see with the evidence across the screen here. It is, I have to say, somewhat remarkable evidence. Again, the gold bars, the cash, the gifts. This is a... Um, really astonishing in terms of the breadth and depth of the evidence against the senator. Uh, Robert, I want to bring you into this conversation. All of this is taking place under the backdrop of uh, Congress, congressional Republicans accusing the Department of Justice of unequal treatment, of witch hunts, of weaponizing the Justice Department. How common is it to see the Justice Department bringing charges against a sitting senator or elected politician? White World, not very common at all. Uh, when Justice Department investigators, particularly in the Southern District of New York, take on investigations like this, they take it very seriously. And they, as Jessica said, the, the evidence laid out in the indictment is indeed remarkable. There are three charges here, but it's almost a 40-page indictment. And so that shows us that prosecutors wanted to make sure that I's were dotted, T's were crossed on this indictment because they did indeed bring it against a sitting senator. There are not, uh, it is a very rare occurrence for this to happen. Um, and uh, as we will discuss later, uh, Menendez did face charges a few years ago um, related to a separate case. But again, it's very rare for Justice Department to bring charges against well, sitting senators. Jessica, on this case, now that the senator has been indicted, what happens next? What next steps should we expect to see in this case? So we've become sadly familiar with elected public officials or former elected public officials facing federal criminal charges. And so uh, this might feel almost, I hope it doesn't, but it might feel almost routine to people. So mm -hmm. next there will be an arraignment and Senator Menendez will enter a plea. We expect that he will enter a not guilty plea unless there is some sort of plea deal that is offered to him. I think one of the things we need to watch that will be really interesting to see is do the prosecutors try to essentially pit Senator Menendez and his wife against each other and get one to give evidence against another. That would be difficult because of certain evidentiary privileges that spouses share. Um, but it's something that I think legally we need to look for. So after Senator Menendez enters his plea, then what we can expect is what we've seen in cases that involve the former president, for instance. There will be motion practice where the senator will say, exclude this evidence. This type of evidence should not be included in a trial. And the prosecution will say, yes, it can. There will be um, there will be fighting about witnesses, for instance. There will be fighting potentially about experts. And then eventually we could see a trial. As we just discussed, the senator actually successfully fought off 
separate charges in a previous trial. Yeah, and I want to bring Robert back into that because uh, that 2015 bribery and conspiracy charges were uh, resulted in a hung jury, and then uh, the judge ultimately ruled in Menendez's favor. Rob, how does this case compare to that one? Right. So in 2015, he was charged with uh, counts related to an alleged bribery scheme with hit between uh, the senator and a friend of his, an eye doctor. As you mentioned, that ended with a mistrial after a jury was hung, and the Justice Department opted not to further prosecute or retry the case. Here, what we have is Menendez, his wife, and three business partners who have been charged in this alleged scheme, working, as the Justice Department alleges, be together to enrich themselves and benefit the government of Egypt. Now, it's important to point out uh, just that uh, Menendez did release a statement uh, just recently, and he said, quote, at the end, I am confident that this matter will be successfully resolved once all of the facts are presented, and my fellow New Jerseyans will see this for what it is. So he is saying that this is a politically motivated uh, prosecution and says that, and in this longer statement that he provided, uh, uh, harkens back to that 2015 and 2017 prosecution and says, remember, Remember what happened there. This is just another example of that. Oh. All right, Jessica Levinson and Robert Legary, thanks to you both. For more on this, congressional correspondent Nicole Killian is joining us from Capitol Hill. Uh, Nicole, how much influence does Senator Menendez hold in the Senate? How is he viewed on Capitol Hill? And how does all this potentially play into the larger politics, especially when we're thinking about reelection campaigns, uh, et cetera? Well, Senator Menendez is pretty influential here on Capitol Hill, of course, being the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which, of course, is uh, it's alleged that he kind of used that role uh, to, again, uh, perhaps allegedly enrich uh, some of these business partners that he was working with and benefit of the government of Egypt. So, uh, you know, it does beg the question uh, what happens now to his committee chairmanship, although certainly in a statement, uh, you know, the senator has made clear that he believes that this indictment misrepresents his congressional work, but he has been here uh, on the Hill serving for almost two decades. And again, you see in that statement, they have misrepresented my congressional work. But, uh, you know, that being said, obviously the Senate is out, so it's not like we're getting a lot of immediate reaction from members. Uh, that is certainly likely to trickle in, perhaps on social media and over the course of the weekend. And as we pointed out in the graphic that you just showed, you know, this is not the first time that the senator has been indicted. And granted, you know, it was on bribery charges as well that resulted in a mistrial. But it does beg the question uh, about kind of what happens to his his role on the Hill, uh, whether he will still wield uh, the same kind of influence that he has, and particularly among Democrats, you know, whether they will defend him or whether they will put some space between them. Um, certainly, we expect Republicans likely will be very critical uh, of this, but, you know, it does, it is interesting to look at his response that he does see this uh, kind of as a something being politically motivated, because we certainly know on the other side, when we have seen indictments involving uh, Republicans, oftentimes we see a similar response. Uh, so certainly no lawmaker immune here on Capitol Hill. Nicole, I also want to ask you about this looming federal shutdown. Congress has left for the weekend without reaching a deal. So what are the sticking points that are holding up negotiations? Well, we just heard a short time ago from Speaker Kevin McCarthy, and so there is work that's happening. Again, the Senate here, it's pretty quiet, but over in the House, the Rules Committee is meeting this afternoon. They are taking up four separate appropriations bills, and the hope is that they can vote on the rule for these appropriations bills uh, this coming Tuesday when the full House returns. Now, this is a different strategy and a different approach that House Republicans are taking. You know, the Speaker emphasized that it's still important to move forward with some type of short-term spending plan or continuing resolution. But in terms of these appropriation bills, keep in mind this is part of the bigger picture here. You know, no one wants to continue to do these stopgap measures. They want to actually pass these appropriations appropriations bills, which will fund the government uh, in its entirety and fund various agencies. They have to work through 12 of those bills, and so they want to try to jumpstart that process uh, by going through these initial sets of bills, hoping that that might assuage some members to try to sign on to a short-term package within the next week. All right, just days away. Nicole Killian on Capitol Hill for us. Nicole, thank you. You bet.